If you're going to take on former President Donald Trump, you're going to have to prove to the Republican Party and specifically to even juggles that you love Israel, that you will stand with Israel, that you will fight anti-Semitism, that you understand uh, the evil nature of the Iranian regime, and that you want to expand peace between Israel and the Arab world, and that you are willing to build a policy to take down, or at least contain at the minimum, but hopefully take down and neutralize the Iranian nuclear threat. Is Israel becoming the Iowa of the Republican presidential campaign? Hi, this is Joel Rosenberg in Jerusalem. I'm at the Museum of Tolerance where the Jerusalem Post has been having a big conference here as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the prophetic and miraculous rebirth of the state of Israel. And the major speakers here uh, today were uh, Israeli President Isaac Herzog, fascinating to hear his remarks, the mayor of Jerusalem, other uh, major luminaries speaking to a mixed crowd of uh, Israelis and uh, foreigners who come, uh, Christian Zionists, as well as, uh, as people from all over the world. But the main event, the keynote event, was the speech by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. DeSantis has not yet uh, announced his intention to run for the Republican nomination, but there's tremendous speculation. He was asked about it during a press conference here. His speech was to a standing room only crowd. Uh, it received multiple uh, standing ovations. Let's take a look. Throughout 2000 years of exile and dispersion of the Jewish people, the bond between the Jewish people and this holy land was never severed. Both the Balfour Declaration and the British Mandate recognize the historic connection of the Jewish people with the land of Israel and acknowledge the compelling basis for reconstituting their national home right here in the Holy Land. Our alliance with Israel rests on unique cultural and religious affinities. The Judeo-Christian values that trace back thousands of years to the Holy Land and which have been essential to the American experiment. So the task before us as Americans is standing strongly and forthrightly with Israel and with the Jewish people. We must support Israel's right to defend itself. And that includes strong military and intelligence cooperation. It also, it also includes supporting Israel maintaining its qualitative military superiority with systems such as Iron Dome. We must also ensure that however the future political winds may blow, the U.S. Embassy will always be right here in Jerusalem. That's never going to change. The governor made news here by signing a series of, uh, of declarations and announcing a number of trade deals. One of the things is that El Al, the national airline of Israel, has just decided to move its Amer North American headquarters from New York, where it's been for you know, 50 or more years, to Florida. This is a huge win uh, for the governor and the state of Florida. And, it, and there will now be two direct flights from Florida cities here to Israel. Uh, the governor praised it, and so did the CEO of, uh, of Al Al. He talked about the numerous times uh, that he has been here in the past. Uh, he talked about his wife uh, bringing uh, water from the Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee, back to uh, Florida when he was a congressman uh, before they had children. Why? So that he could baptize uh, his children as they started to have them with water uh, from Israel. Governor DeSantis made it crystal clear that Iran's uh, theocratic uh, regime is the most dangerous threat, not only to Israel, but to the United States out of the Middle East. In fact, uh, DeSantis spoke of the regime in Tehran as apocalyptic, Let's see what he had to say. Since its inception in 1979, uh, the Islamist regime in, in Iran has viewed the United States uh, as its foremost enemy and Israel probably close behind. And so we share that. And if you look at this, the challenges that we see as a matter of, of strategic, strategic in this region, Iran's pursuit of nuclear weapons uh, creates a risk uh, unlike you've not seen in this region. Their ideology, an apocalyptic ideology, combined with the ability to use humanity's worst weapons, represents a threat, uh, an existential threat to the state of Israel, and it represents a threat 
to the United States of America. And I'm just proud that uh, as a congressman, like many of you, you know, we saw through this uh, many years ago when they tried to do this Iranian nuclear deal. Uh, we said that all it would do was empower Iran. Uh, and guess what happened? They got billions and billions of dollars flooded into their coffers. What did they use that money to? Did they make the citizenry's lives better in Iran? Of course not. They used that to fund terrorism all around the Middle East. And so we opposed it. The deal failed. And I think it's important going forward that we learn from that and learn that you cannot approach them in a way that is going to empower the regime. You must hold the regime accountable. And that's what U.S. policy should do. But also, he held a press conference, and I had the opportunity to ask him two questions at the press conference. The first was this, as an evangelical dual U.S. Israeli citizen, I wanted to know whether the governor sees the 75th anniversary of the rebirth of Israel in 1948 simply as wonderful, hardworking Zionists uh, fighting and building this country from scratch, or does he also see a biblical, prophetic element? Since he is a Christian, let's take a look at his answer. As a Christian, how do you see the 75th uh, anniversary of Israel? Do you see it as prophetic? Do you see it as biblical? Or do you just see it as good, solid uh, Zionism or both? Great question. So the first question is, yeah, I think it's both. You know, when you come and you've been on delegations, you can sit there and you can study the Bible in America, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's great and it's inspiring, but when you actually come here, you see what happened there. They can show you. They can show you the artifacts. You can walk in the city of David. If there's something there, they can point out, and it comes to life. And so you see that, and you're like, man. And, and of course, it's, you show the unmistakable thousands and thousands of years of connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel. I mean, some of the modern debates acts like somehow that Jews just decided to show up here or something and like claim a state. No, they were exiled. They were dispersed forcibly. But this is where uh, the Jewish people uh, were born as, as, a, as, a, as a people thousands of years ago. And so that's really, really significant. And so the 75th, is really a reconstitution, or recognizes the anniversary, 75th anniversary of the reconstitution of the Jewish state uh, of Israel. And so I think that that's something that, that, that we can be proud of. The next question I asked Governor DeSantis was this. Uh, I have led several evangelical delegations throughout the Middle East, actually seven of them. And I told him that I've led two evangelical delegations to meet with the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, one of the few Israeli citizens who ever had an opportunity to meet publicly uh, with uh, the Saudi crown prince. And I asked him, Governor, do you believe that it's possible to see in our lifetime and maybe soon an Israeli-Saudi peace treaty? Uh, does he see the Saudis as an ally of the United States or does he see Saudi Arabia and the crown prince as a pariah state and, uh, and, and a problem for the United States the way President Biden uh, keeps speaking about the Saudis? Let's take a look at his answer. And secondly, I've had an opportunity to lead two evangelical delegations to Saudi Arabia to meet with Mohammed bin Salman. Just curious if you see a pathway forward for an Israeli-Saudi uh, peace treaty, even with President Biden speaking of it being a pariah state. I wondered if you could comment on sure. that. Sure. With respect to Saudi Arabia, I, I think that th this administration has worked overtime to alienate the Saudis. Uh, my view would be that there's an opportunity, and I mentioned the speech, you have a great opportunity to have a U.S.-Israel Arab country alliance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the nefarious influence of the Iranians. And I think that that's something that's doable, uh, but I think that that's something that, that, that you got to work for. And absolutely, I think with proper policy and proper relations, you could see Saudi Arabia recognize the existence of Israel. Who would have thought that that would have been anything that anyone could have talked about even 10 years ago uh, I hosted, I mentioned in my speech, I was recently in my office in Tallahassee with the, US, the ambassador to the United States from Israel, and sitting next to him was the ambassador to the United States from the UAE. That would not have been something that would have been possible even five or six years ago, and yet there they are. And if you listened, 
they were basically focusing on how you move forward in a way that uh, is, is stressing common interest. They understand that there are common threats. They understand there's a lot of opportunities for collaboration through with the two countries. That is something that I think represents the path forward here. Uh, and I, I would hope that the administration would try to get. Th those Abraham Accords uh, were historic. I think that they were uh, incredibly positive. It gave great momentum to things that are happening in the Middle East. And part of it is because you know, the Trump administration got out of the Iran deal. That sent a great signal to the, the, the Sunni Arab states. I also think that moving the embassy uh, helped get us the Abraham Accords. And people say, well, how do you think that? They didn't want the embassy in Jerusalem. They didn't. But I think when, you, when America shows strength and resolve, uh, people in this region really respect that. Is Israel the new Iowa when it comes to the Republican presidential nomination journey? If you're gonna take on former President Donald Trump, you're gonna have to prove to the Republican Party and specifically to evangelicals that you love Israel, that you will stand with Israel, that you will fight anti-Semitism, that you understand uh, the evil nature of the Iranian regime, and that you want to expand peace between Israel and the Arab world, and that you are willing to build a policy to take down, or at least contain at the minimum, but hopefully take down and neutralize the Iranian nuclear threat. So my bottom line here is that I think, yes, uh, Israel is becoming uh, the new Iowa, that you do have to come here. And I think the fact that DeSantis came, and not just to stop by, but to give a major speech, uh, to meet with Israeli President Isaac Herzog, uh, to meet with major Jewish leaders, to meet with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and others, uh, was a big indicator that he regards Israel as a must stop as he would Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, or anywhere else. Look, I'm not taking a position on whether he's the right guy or what, uh, whether Trump is the right guy. I wanna make sure that you get to meet these candidates. You get to hear what they say, what they think, especially when it comes to Israel and Middle East policy. That's what the Rosenberg Report is doing. We are helping you understand um, how to understand the US-Israeli relationship, the dynamic in the region. And if major figures are coming here, uh, we, we're gonna report on it. Which means I have to mention one other thing. DeSantis was not the only uh, major American political figure, however, to come here to Israel, to Jerusalem for the 75th anniversary. There was also a delegation of uh, senior Democrats from the House of Representatives and Speaker of the House, Republican uh, Kevin McCarthy, came to give an address to the Knesset. Uh, we were covered all of this on all Israel news, but I just want to make a point that Speaker McCarthy, McCarthy's speech to the Knesset was the first time that an American Speaker of the House has addressed the Knesset since uh, Newt Gingrich did as Speaker back in the late 1990s. So it was a big deal. Why didn't Nancy Pelosi come? Why didn't other Speakers of the House in the past come and give uh, a major address here? That I cannot tell you. I can tell you that Speaker Haster, or, or rather, not Speaker Haster, uh, Speaker McCarthy decided it was a must decision for him to come and to do it. Uh, let's take a quick look at what he said. In an interview yesterday with Israel Hayom, you were quoted as saying that if President Biden does not invite Prime Minister Netanyahu to the White House, you will do so to Congress. Was that quote accurate? And, and yes. does that remain the case? Yes. Um, look, I had a, have a long relationship with the Prime Minister, longest serving Prime Minister of Israel. Um, I think two great nations that uh, have strong bonds should continue and work together. I've invited President Herzog to come and give a joint session inside Congress. We're working out the day that that could come very soon, hopefully this summer. Um, but I think for the same time, too, that uh, the prime minister should come and meet with members. We had a great lunch, bipartisan lunch. And when we do that, I would invite and set with Hakeem Jeffries, who is uh, the Democratic leader, and we would do it in a bipartisan way that we could sit down with um, the prime minister, discuss the region, discuss the challenges and ways that we can continue to build our bond stronger together. Well, that's our show for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Fascinating show as we, we, we talk about all the different leaders that are coming in from the United States to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the rebirth of the state of Israel. Of course, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis making a big splash here as we wait and uh, hit the news whether he will run for the Republican nomination or not. 